Good afternoon, everyone. We are about to get underway. I have two o'clock on my computer here, so I think we'll get started. First, I want to uh, welcome everybody and so glad that you're joining us. Uh, this is our fifth day and the beginning of our third week for our annual uh, reentry conference. And um, I want to first start by saying thank you to all the folks at the Arches uh, staff, as well as the planning committee for this conference. It's been remarkable and especially the ability for us all to pivot to this new platform and to uh, have the conference uh, throughout the whole month. Uh, it's been very, very exciting. My name is Bill Dent and I'm speaking to you from the great grand metropolis of Holt Summit, Missouri in Great Callaway County. It's good to see all of you on the webinar today. Um, I, am the, I have the privilege of being the executive director of an organization called the Family and Community Trust. We're about 28 years old and we are a private public corporation that looks to uh, connect state agencies and communities all across the state in, uh, in dealing with children and families and looking for creative and innovative ways to do that. Um, just a bit of a recap. So for the last couple of weeks, we've had some very, very good presentations. And last week we heard from Dr. Marty Leathers who delivered a, the keynote presentation and talked about the great things that the that workforce development uh, is doing around the state, including initiatives that directly impact what this conference is about, the, the work of reentry. And then on Thursday, we had a, a, a really splendid example of how state agencies have been working together in new and, and inspiring ways to help serve the clients that, that we've been talking about prior to their release. And we heard some, some fantastic uh, cross-sectoral efforts that will, uh, will have long lasting impact on those folks who are returning to our communities. But if for some reason uh, you missed any of those um, events and efforts over the last couple of weeks, uh, please take a look at the, um, at the app because everything that uh, we've done so far is there. And if you haven't downloaded the app, make sure you do so because there's a lot of opportunity to look at the film festivals that we've been doing, uh, look at the wall, what people have posted, um, and it's just a great way to connect. So please make sure that you, if you haven't downloaded the app, that you do so. I need to do a little bit of housekeeping before we begin this afternoon, and um, that's related to the webinar. So we're in the Zoom world, right? But this is a Zoom webinar, not a Zoom meeting, and so all the attendees who are on you're not on camera and that you've automatically been muted um, by the system. And I do want to uh, make sure that everybody is aware that this uh, meeting, this webinar will be, uh, is being recorded. And so we'll be able to go back to it later on. Um, so the way we're gonna utilize kind of our two-way communication in, in this world is we're gonna use the chat box in the, at the bottom of the toolbar, as well as the Q and A feature. And in the chat, you're able to, to chat to hosts and the panelists only. And you can either do that to one or the other or to both those groups all at the same time. And feel free to use that. As you can see, some folks have already, have already chimed in. And I wanna note that I put in not only the Department of Social Services email or a website address, but I also posted the MoFact address for, for our organization, the organization that I represent. And then the, when we get to the Q and A section at the end of the uh, at the end of the session, um, those questions will be delivered to us uh, via the Q and A window, and then they'll pop in there once once they've been answered. The other thing I want to mention: um, some were talking about the ability to see two sides, and the 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 uh, PowerPoint was too small. Well, you have some ability to to manage that on your screen, so. In the center of the screen, you can kind of move it back and forth uh, and it will increase one side or the other. And then if you look at the Zoom toolbar, there's a drop down list. So you can see some options there of, of what kind of view you wanna have. So you do have some ability to, to facilitate and change that view from your perspective. Um, the other thing I definitely wanna make sure that we thank uh, all of our sponsors and we're certainly thankful to the Missouri Coalition of Recovery and Support Providers for the sponsoring not only of the app, but also the website. So just again, a reminder, there's a great feature called the shake feature. So all of us who are in this, uh, this keynote uh, address this afternoon, 
um, if you shake, you'll connect to those other folks who are who are in that meeting, and it's just a great way to uh, connect with each other and 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 build some build some camaraderie and some coalitions. Also, you can post to the wall as I had mentioned before, and you can uh, check out all the sponsors and the exhibits. And don't forget the the film festival. So that's kind of the uh, the introductory uh, information that I need to supply. And now um, it, it's really a privilege and an honor for me to, to introduce our, our keynote speaker this afternoon. Um, Jennifer Tidball currently serves as the acting director of the Department of Social Services. And, and most of you know, I believe, the department is the umbrella organization that houses um, the Children's Division, the Family Support Division, Mo Health Net Division, which is the Medicaid unit of, of the department, and the Division of Youth Services. And together, all of those organizations, all those divisions within the department, they're responsible for a broad array of services that protect children, that help people access healthcare, help rehabilitate troubled youth, and generally promote strong and self-supporting families across our great state. The department serves, which is an astounding number, 2 million Missourians annually. And they do that with an operational budget that approaches nine and a half billion, that's B with a, uh, that's billion with a B. And they have about seven, almost 6,900 um, full-time employees. And that includes about 180 offices across the straight, state. And so Jennifer has served as the deputy director prior to her being appointed to her current position as the acting director of the department. So, Prior to Jennifer's job, uh, she was also had a couple of significant roles within the department that kind of give her this really broad base uh, platform from which she not only can speak to us today, but experience uh, across the department. She was also the, uh, the uh, head of the Division of Finance and Administrative Services. And she also served um, in a, in a I would say a very difficult role as the interim director for the Mo Health Dent Division, which I referenced was the Medicaid agency, in and of itself a, a large organization. So she has worked for the Missouri Department of Self Social Services for, for, for many years within a lot of the divisions, has a broad base uh, uh, of experience from which she's gonna to speak to us today. The other thing that I wanna mention is that another role that uh, she often doesn't talk about but by virtue of her position, she becomes the co-chairman of the organization that I represent, the public, private organization called the Family and Community Trust. So she's the co-chairperson of that by virtue of her position as the director of the Department of Social Services. Jennifer holds a Bachelor of Arts in Poli Sci, as well as a Master's of Public Administration from the University of Missouri. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you not only the director of the Missouri Department of Social Services, co-chairperson of the FACT board, but my friend, Jennifer Tidball. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, um, thank you, Bill, for that uh, gracious introduction and um, happy to be speaking today. I have to say this is my first Zoom webinar, so um, bear with me. I'm gonna to try to speak and look at the uh, camera, but sometimes it's just easier to look at the screen. So um, thank you for having me. Thank you for Arches and the Planning Committee, um, you know, our sister agency, Department of Corrections, and, uh, you know, for hosting what I know is a, 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 like a new way for us to engage and talk about reentry and how we support um, those Missouri citizens who are justice involved. So, I mean, I don't have to tell anyone that uh, these are unprecedented times. Uh, it's a pretty trite thing, and I get tired of hearing it and saying it, but, you know, it's the reality that we're living right now, and um, what I'm going to speak with you today is about how our Department of Social Services has been able to engage in much broader conversations with other uh, departments, but then also been able to hopefully uh, look at uh, the situation that we've been dealt with COVID-19 and be able to adapt accordingly. Uh, to serve citizens. So, you know, to step back, our, our mission is pretty simple. Uh, we want to empower Missourians to live safe, healthy, and productive lives. And so you might think about from a reentry conference standpoint, you know, why um, the Department of Social Services is speaking with you today. 
but um, I'm here to tell you that we serve many of the same citizens. So we've even done some data uh, looking and you may have heard uh, about that from uh, Jerry Ann Yeager's Brennecke when she spoke in the um, um, on Thursday during as one of the panelists around how we've learned that uh, we serve the same families, that there are families behind every single one of those justice involved individuals, or they had been part of our system in the past. So we have a strong interest in making sure that we're not only supporting those justice involved uh, individuals that are reentering the communities, but also in supporting uh, families um, that they have that they want, want to come back and engage with and support. So again, I'm here to just talk with you a little bit about um, what how we've been able to uh, provide services to citizens and adapt to COVID-19. And when I thought about, you know, how do I structure something that's meaningful and makes sense and has some kind of a sequencing to it, um, I started to reflect on, you know, what's happened over the last eight months of our lives. And I started with when I got the news that we had the first COVID-19 case in Missouri. And I happened to get a call from someone from the governor's office uh, the afternoon of March the 7th, which was a Saturday. I so happened to be in St. Louis um, because my daughter does competitive dance and we were at a dance competition and learned that that first um, you know, that first case had been found in St. Louis. So, you know, I would just tell you uh, with that news, I frankly never dreamed that we would have uh, um, really uh, witnessed what we have the last eight, eight months and, and frankly accomplished what we've been able to do. So I just wanna talk a little bit about themes around um, how I feel like we have an agency, as an agency have been able to respond to Missouri uh, citizens needs. You know, I will tell you, are we perfect? No, do we have additional things? Could we have done things better? Yes. Um, are we still learning? Absolutely. But I really am proud of not just our social services team, but of our entire um, state government team around how we've responded and served citizens during, um, during a, a pandemic. So, you know, I think the first thing to step back and reflect on is what, what has been successful is communication. And so to think about it in terms of like, how have we communicated, not just as a department, but, but as a, a state agency. And so that started back in, in, in mid-March. So since mid-March, I have been on 7.30 calls with other cabinet members, um, sometimes daily. Uh, now we're two, two, uh, two days a week, but early on we were meeting daily at 7.30 in the morning to just make sure that we stay connected and we knew how we could support each other and we knew what we needed to do um, to serve Missourians. And then it was really important for me to make sure that there was some kind of a cadence with our own department. Um, and so we developed basically a cadence where we got off the phone at, uh, at eight o'clock at 8.15 um, with our, 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 our cabinet colleagues. And we got on the phone with each other in social services at 8.15, 8.30. And we just talked about what we needed to do, what was happening, how we needed to support um, citizens and frankly, each other and our team members uh, during COVID-19. But I think the other thing that's been really important uh, to our, what I would say success in serving citizens, but also uh, just in the response uh, of the Missouri, uh, of Missouri was, um, something called the fusion cell. And I don't know if anyone's talked about that yet, but um, many of you may be, or some of you may be familiar with uh, General Stanley McChrystal. He's a uh, retired general. He wrote a book called Team of Teams. And um, really, you know, his tactics were in response uh, to um, his, uh, his uh, um, leadership uh, uh, during a, a fight against Al-Qaeda. And, um, understanding that um, what had been uh, conventional military tactics uh, for the United States did not work um, when we were at war with Al Qaeda. And from that, if you look at the fusion cell makeup, if you look at and you read uh, uh, General um, McChrystal's team of team books, it, there's no straight line as far as um, you know, subordinate to in charge. It's a matter of everyone can be a leader, everyone contributes. You know, at the end of the day, of course, the buck stops with someone, 
but recognizing that there aren't um, linear patterns in um, dealing with Al Qaeda, or frankly, in this case, COVID-19, that those patterns are, are um, you know, very different and, um, and that everyone can contribute. And quite frankly, the work is so enormous that not if one person tried to do everything, it just wouldn't get done. So from that, you know, there's a fusion cell. Uh, every single State Department has team members that participate on a daily basis. And, you know, that fusion cell takes on pain points around COVID-19. So some of the things over the, the year or the months that that uh, fusion cell has dealt with is PPE. So how do we are we able to not only supply PPE to our state workforce, but um, you know what about what about our manufacturers? So what about the um, the processing plants? You know the meat processing plants. What about our schools? What about uh, facilities that we might support that are housing children? So our residential uh, treatment facilities. So, so there was an entire team that put a. A, a really robust plan together around how are we going to support Missouri and PPE production and making sure that we have what we need um, around testing. So how are we going to structure testing, whether that be in 24 seven facilities that operate in the state of Missouri. So Department of Corrections, um, we have Division of Youth Services. So um, the youth programs, um, the veterans homes, um, the Department of Mental Health, but also how are we uh, going to support and and structure a local community testing uh, for community providers. Because to remember, you know, local public health agencies have a, a lot of discretion around how they manage a health emergency in their community, but uh, many of them, they clearly don't have the resources nor the bandwidth to be able to do that without support from state government. Uh, economic recovery. So how are we as state agencies going to support communities in economic uh, recovery? Um, a vaccination plan, and that was just released last week by Governor Parson, and we got uh, kudos as a state. Governor Parson did around uh, the vaccination plan that has been submitted to the federal government um, for, purposes of, for purposes of vaccinating when um, we do have the COVID-19 vaccination. So um, a lot of um, opportunities and cadence and communication. And, you know, why is that important? Um, well, it clearly supported our department work, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but you get things done, right? The more people that you have um, engaged, you just get things done. The more bodies, the more minds, and you have better ideas. So you recognize that, you know, we in leadership positions don't have all of the great ideas. Uh, there are plenty of team members, plenty of stakeholders that have great ideas, and, and how do you capture that in the fusion cell? Um, and even our other uh, meeting cadences gives an opportunity uh, to do that for resources. So you find out, you know, everyone lays their needs on the table. What are your pain points? What, what are you worried about? What keeps you up at night? And then we talk as a team about what resources we have and how we can work together um, to support those needs. And again, it really does go back to Missouri citizens and, and why we're here, like why we exist as state government and that's to serve to serve citizens. And, and, and then another reason is just to check on each other's well-being. So um, I, I learned really quickly that, you know, I looked forward to that meeting cadence uh, to be able to share what I needed to from a department standpoint, but even our Department of Social Services cadence, our own team, it was just a way to check and understand how everyone's doing. It's remarkable, you know, what you can hear in someone's voice and how you can uh, support. And it's one thing that I've continued to stress to our local leadership and our teams is the importance, especially as I'll talk about, we have a number of team members working remotely to stay connected. And one way to do that is to have some kind of a cadence where there's just an expectation that at 730 on Monday mornings and Thursday mornings, I'm going to hear these voices um, and, and just to make sure everyone's doing okay. So communication is key. Um, I think, uh, you know, another theme that we had to think about or work on was taking chances and being adaptable. 
you know, I, I mean, we're a bureaucracy, right? Like Bill just mentioned, you know, we have, you know, 6,900 team members. We're in 180 offices. We have a broad array of work that we do from, you know, basically funding medical care for over 950,000 people, you know, to serving 13,700 children in foster care, to providing SNAP benefits to over 700,000 uh, Missourians on a monthly basis. So we, we touch a lot of lives, but, and we're maybe not always willing to take chances because the stakes are high. But where we found ourselves was that, you know, we had to look at balancing serving our citizens, um, but keeping our team members safe, our families safe, our communities safe, but then also structuring our response so that it met local ordinances, it met social dis distancing requirements. You know, for some time in April and May, it also met the requirement that our offices were not open uh, for business at all. And so always keeping in mind, how do we serve those 2 million plus citizens that rely on services every day to get health care, um, to eat, um, to have child care so that they are able to go to work. So uh, we really had to step back and get uncomfortable with making decisions. So, you know, that started with how are we going to serve citizens if we can't have our offices open to the public? So, um, you know, the first thing we did is we said, we have to get team members home. We have to find uh, a way for team members to work from their homes if they can. I'll talk a little bit about our youth services and our 24 seven facilities. And that just wasn't a possibility, but um, you know, those who can work from home, how do we get them home? And so, you know, over the course of a month or two, uh, we got a number of our team members home. And today, about 75% to 80% of our Department of Social Services workforce is spending time at home working. Some of them are full time at home. Some of them are just coming into the office to grab certain reports off of printers, et cetera. Uh, but it really was. Uh, being able to adapt and taking chances that um, that first, frankly, the technology would work, but um, that we had team members that could, excuse me, work from home. And, um, I, you know, I would tell you, we spent about a year talking about getting one of our divisions working from home. And when COVID-19 hit, we did it in two weeks. And so, um, you know, like I said, what it's done is it's given our team member um, you know, some faith in, in, in the fact that, you know, they can't, we can't accomplish big things and that we have to take chances, you know, but we also understood that having our offices closed, um, that wasn't uh, conducive to a lot of uh, our citizens and how they do business with us. But we also knew that was the right thing to do uh, because to open our offices would not only put our team members at risk, but it would also put our citizens at risk. And quite frankly, in some parts of the state, it, it was it was it was not legal at the time, like we could not have offices open. So, um, you know, we adapted by increasing our call center hours. So we just said we're going to serve citizens between 630, six o'clock in the morning and 630 at night, Monday through Friday. And we're going to operate a call center from eight to five on Saturday. And those extended hours continue not only because it gives us more uh, access or citizens more access to us, but it also supports team members who may need flexible work schedules, especially during this time where they're not only just managing their professional career, but they may also be teacher when uh, schools are not open uh, for in-seat learning. Uh, we do have about 20 offices open but they are not in the metro areas and they are by appointment only. So citizens are able to uh, either call or go online and um, receive uh, to get an appointment. But we continue from an adaptability standpoint to um, watch the positivity rates and we have closed offices temporarily when we see communities that have a high uh, positive, positivity rate of COVID-19. Um, I will tell you that being able to adapt and to work differently has been a little bit easier during this time because there is some work that we are prohibited from doing on our caseload. So especially around Medicaid uh, because we are in a federal state of emergency. So a uh, part of uh, what we'll have to do is think about, 
you know, that balance between adaptability and supporting team members and citizens and the fact that at some, biz, at some time we will get back to kind of what our, our normal caseload um, looks like and our normal work looks like. I've talked a lot about, um, about services that would be more around like our SNAP, our, our child care eligibility, Medicaid eligibility, but I think it's important to note uh, every single one of our divisions had to adapt and to take chances. So our children's division, you know, if you think about that, uh, we, you know, we do have a 24-7 abuse and neglect hotline. We immediately moved that hotline home, frankly, after we had two positive COVID-19 cases in the hotline because we can't afford to have team members not answering that phone. So, you know, we were able to do that, but we do know that some of our work continues in person. So we can't investigate um, calls uh, virtually. We have to be in families' homes uh, connecting with families. So, you know, as we were asking some team members to go home, we were asking others uh, to uh, wear PPE and to go into homes after asking a few uh, health-related questions uh, of families. I will uh, tell you, we've tried to minimize that. So we for, for several months, and I think some circuits, it's really kind of circuit-based what they do, but they continue to uh, support their work and support families and children virtually. So a lot of our caseworkers are visiting uh, their, their, their children in foster care on their caseload and those foster families virtually. Um, they are connecting with biological families virtually. Some of the feedback has been, uh, in some cases, Families have been uh, uh, more engaged and our youth have been, especially our older youth, have been more engaged with our uh, children's service workers virtually because people just feel more comfortable connecting over, um, over video, for example, and they don't feel as intimidated as they may be uh, do in person. So, I mean, that's just part of understanding long term, how do we can restructure our work because there may be opportunities to continue uh, virtual interaction, and that's just a better way to support families and children. Um, our Division of Youth Services, I know you've heard from Director Preside, so you know the pain points, I'm sure, around uh, corrections. And, you know, our, our facilities are not near as large, uh, but clearly we have similar type pain points around the fact that we've had to manage COVID-19 in facilities. Uh, we've had to think about how we staff those facilities, um, how we work with courts where we have youth that may be picked up because they ran or they've been adjudicated and they, you know, they, we are going to place them in division of youth services, you know, just making sure that we are uh, mitigating introducing COVID-19 into, into those facilities. Um, and then just visits, right? So we are just now reopening uh, uh, visits uh, of, of family members to our youth. And to think about it in terms of, and I know a uh, Department of Corrections is very similar, uh, to not only be living in a facility where you have COVID-19 outbreaks, but also where you haven't had that um, a personal interaction with your families for a number of months. Um, you know, continuing on serving citizens, you know, I think the last piece I would talk about is from a Medicaid standpoint. So, um, you know, if you think about it, and and I witnessed this in my own life was, you know, I had just maintenance uh, medical appointments that were canceled, and um, and for a, a time, prov medical providers weren't doing anything but COVID nineteen, and uh, we know that um, even if they were seeing patients, that um, they only wanted to see patients virtually. And on our Medicaid rolls, we have a number of, uh, of citizens who are extremely vulnerable. So they have uh, compromising health conditions and uh, we just needed to make sure that we found a way to support their health needs and support how providers needed to do their work. So we, uh, we were very aggressive in opening up telemedicine. And quite frankly, it's worked so well we don't want to go back. So one of the uh, strategies that we have long term is to figure out how we continue to support citizens and um, support providers through telemedicine. And, you know, the beauty of that, too, it not only, you know, solves maybe the health issues around uh, someone being out and about in the community, but we also know, and I would probably say with, with um, our justice involved, we see the same thing, is transportation pain points. So, 
It's also a way for the citizen to get the services that they need in their home and not have to worry about, um, about transportation. And then I think finally, the thing that I would say around serving citizens, and this is fairly new, is we've had um, uh, Sentinel testing in our 24 seven uh, facility. So in Division of Youth Services and our other um, sister agency facilities for some time, but starting to open up Sentinel mm -hmm. testing to other uh, state workforce team members. And you know that's for the purpose of making sure that we are keeping our team members safe, we're keeping uh, their family safe, community safe, and that we're able to identify those individuals who are um, frankly asymptomatic and positive for COVID-19 to just help uh, continue to manage outbreaks um, in our communities. Um, I think the, the next piece I wanna talk about, that so moving from how we served to what we did, and I think this, um, when you look at the conversation piece or was around like, what programs did we put in place for citizens that supported them and frankly continue to support them um, through through these times. So, you know, a lot of our programs and our changes were around food support. So we we uh, we are the department that implements the SNAP program. So the food stamp program sits on their department of social services. And one of the things early on that we have the opportunity to do and we continue to do is if families are eligible for SNAP benefits, uh, they get the maximum allowable amount for their household size. So depending on a family's, uh, uh, depending on a household's income, they may get the maximum allowable, they may not, like typically. But now all families are getting uh, the maximum allowable. So it puts um, more uh, money in families' hands to be able to purchase food. And I think the other reason that's really important is a lot of kids stayed at home this year. A lot of, you know, there was more home time for children where families, frankly, may have relied on um, school food. They may have relied on camps. They might have relied on other uh, means to feed families. And uh, if those weren't available or they weren't comfortable with having their children out in the community, then um, this was an opportunity for them to uh, receive more food stamp benefits, more SNAP benefits to, to feed their family. And that continues. So as long as there is a federal health emergency in place, Missouri will continue to request uh, to be able to pay that maximum allowable amount. Um, the other um, food stamp kind of related benefit that we did was specific to families who have um, children. And so, um, when the pandemic hit in March and um, kids went home, there was a lot of concern around how are families going to uh, feed children uh, because it's not in the budget. I mean, I think many of us take, um, you know, take for granted the fact that, you know, we may have some modest disposable income or unbudgeted income to be able to uh, purchase additional food, but there are families that rely on those um, food benefits uh, you know, the free and reduced price lunches to be able to feed their families. And so, or um, maybe even the buddy pack, for example, for, you know, for um, food during the weekends or in the evenings. And so one program that we partnered with Department of Elementary and Secondary Education around was what was called the PEBT program. And basically what that did is that was a benefit for um, families who were eligible for free or reduced price lunches during those months, so it would have been during March, April, May, when um, school was not in session and children were learning from home. And so through that program, we served 154,000 households and nearly 290,000 children. So that's a program stay continued, whether or not we will uh, participate or what that participation looks like in the fall and the spring. Um, it was a pretty daunting task. And um, now we're just looking at what other feeding programs are available for families and how we um, can basically provide this benefit without making it uh, very ominous on the school districts because it really requires a lot of school district engagement. The other thing I think on SNAP is we were not a state that allowed online food purchases. So you know, as, as, as everyone in the state is asking citizens to think about staying at home, um, you know, purchasing, you know, food online, you know, doing grocery pickups, 
our SNAP, um, our SNAP uh, families couldn't do that. I mean, they were able, uh, they had to swipe their card at a point of service device at a grocery store. So they weren't able, um, like frankly I have, is to uh, go to go to hy V online aisles and order my groceries and pay through my credit card and, you know, just go have someone put them in my um, trunk and move on. Like, so just, just con, you know, contactless grocery shopping. So early on, so in May, uh, we actually worked with the USDA and we brought Walmart and Amazon online so that now SNAP uh, participants can purchase their food using their EBT cards online um, uh, through Amazon or through Walmart. And you might ask like, why just those two? Frankly, that's because we have to have approved vendors by USDA and thus far um, USDA hasn't approved any additional uh, vendors. So um, a lot of work around food, uh, supporting childcare. So uh, um, unfortunately the pandemic has really affected the number of childcare facilities that continue to stay open. And where frankly, we had a number of childcare deserts in the past, we have additional uh, childcare deserts. And so supporting providers through additional uh, payments with CARES Act, but also providing families um, additional benefits that we haven't in the past. So um, a family right now through December 31st can, can apply for and get 90 days of, um, of childcare benefits, they have to be income eligible, but for work search. And it doesn't have to be the typical work search being in a work search program. You can actually, um, um, you know, just come to us and say, I'm searching for work and um, we'll provide that, we'll provide that benefit. Also allowing families that, with higher incomes to come in for a partial benefit that we haven't in the past. And I'll just mention, I think Bill put in the in the chat our Department of Social Services website. But if you go to our website, dss.mo.gov, you'll see at the top there's a COVID-19 banner. All the information I'm talking about now is listed uh, um, below these. So for the, you know, to the extent that you think that could be helpful for families or citizens that you serve. Um, so, you know, I could go on and on about some, some additional benefits, but I won't. I think those are the highlights. Uh, I do want to talk about now not just the benefits, but thinking about, you know, how did we get the work done, right? So I've talked about communication. I've talked about what the benefits are. You know, I want to talk about how, um, you know, we got the work done. And, and I'll just tell you now more than ever, uh, what we realize is partnerships matter. And it's, and it's not just about the new partnerships that we've um, that, that we've made, but it's about the partnerships that we had in place and that we continue to nurture, quite frankly, even when there may have been disagreement or we weren't always aligned, but we had trust in each other. And um, we were, we had the same, we had the, uh, the same goal in mind, which was we wanted to support uh, citizens and in this case, vulnerable citizens. And, you know, so those partnerships were important. Um, you know, we have a, we developed a, and, and led a food insecurity group. And, um, you know, it, it uh, social services, Department of Corrections, Health and Senior Services, Department of Agriculture, Department of Economic Development, um, Feeding Missouri, which is the Food Bank Association, a representative from the governor's office. We actually welcomed, welcomed um, Lincoln University Extension Center. And really that group was to get together to, to, it really started with supporting the food banks on how, how do we feed Missourians who quite frankly find themselves accessing food banks or food pantries and have never had a need uh, in their life to access those services. So what have we done? I mean, um, you know, we worked with Lincoln University and they actually grew vegetables and they had gardens that then they donated um, food to the food banks. Um, Department of Corrections, we worked with Ken Chapman and his team around um, being able to purchase plants so that uh, justice involved individuals could expand uh, their gardening and then give back to the community by providing food to, um, you know, to the food bank to, to provide to citizens. You know, we worked on how with Department of Agriculture on food boxes that were kind of available through some work that they were doing with uh, USDA and local farmers and how did we distribute those. I mean, we worked um, with the food banks and the food pantries around how do we staff 
those entities when we can't have volunteers out in the community that are able to do that. So that's when the uh, Missouri National Guard stepped in. And, and even now, the National Guard continues to support the food banks. So it, again, I kind of go back to, which I talked about communication, which is getting the right people, the right minds, a lot of resources together to support one common goal. And in this case, it was how do we feed Missourians. Um, workforce engagement. So, you know, we had had relationships with over 200 uh, contractors or local workforce engagement providers, and those continued. So, yes, we had a lull, but, um, you know, we're back engaging those uh, workforce partners. Um, we've had relationships with communities, um, developing relationships with employers, because in many cases, there are jobs out there. It's just how do we work and understand what those pain points are for citizens um, to go back to work? Is it child care? Is it fear of COVID-19? I mean, what are the issues? And then working with employers around how we might communicate with uh, interested citizens and support um, their needs as far as getting employers in their business to do the work. Um, court relationships. So, um, you know, we have a really robust um, work group um, uh, that, that we sit on with uh, a Supreme Court and uh, Office of State Courts Administrator with the juvenile um, um, the MJJA. And, um, you know, and, and we meet on a monthly basis. So when we had pain points around what was happening in courts with uh, COVID-19 and decisions that courts were making, or when we wanted to communicate what our policy was during COVID-19, that was a pretty uh, simple undertaking because of relationships that we had developed in the past and work that had been happening uh, for years. And then I just also want to give a shout out uh, to the community partnerships. Um, and not just because, um, you know, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the fact board. I do Bill get this, get the thumbs up from Bill. But, um, you know, we, I, I turned to them specifically to help me understand what was happening in communities because I, right now I'm sitting in Jefferson City, like I live in Columbia, I sit in Jefferson City. So I don't always know what is happening in other parts of the community, especially when I can't be out and about in the community because it's just not the right decision for me to make right now for our team. And so, you know, early on, I asked a question of Arches and uh, Link in Kansas City when we had learned that some of our largest school districts weren't uh, serving food anymore. So they had closed their feeding sites like early on in March and April. And I just reached out for help or tried to understand what was happening because we knew that we had kids that needed to eat. And, um, you know, before I even asked the question, Arches had already engaged and was working with um, local school districts as was as was Link. So, um, you know, just in, in one of the things that Gail Hobbs said, who's the executive De director of Link, she just talked about, um, back to adaptability, how, um, how Link has, and I think probably most of our partnerships as well as many of us on the, on the call would say like, where we had to understand what were the community needs and we had to adapt. So, you know, Gail talking about, we, you know, reaching out to the school districts and, um, you know, just saying like, who do we need to check on? And she told a story about a five-year-old little girl that they were worried about. They just hadn't, um, they hadn't seen her for some time. And the reality was her, she was living with her grandmother that uh, she was trying, her grandmother had waited in line to try to get her like the connectivity or computer working, et cetera. And she had just given up. And so Link was able to uh, support that grandmother and that child. And, you know, that work continues every day. So that's just an example, but how we've all had to be adaptable. Um, but again, the focus was on why are we in this game? Like, you know, why have I been in social services for 25 plus years? And that's because I believe in the work that we do. And I believe in uh, supporting citizens that need assistance with um, just really basic, basic needs. Um, you know, and, and the last shout out I'll give is around uh, Janet Danker talked, uh, uh, and she's with Community Partnership of the Ozark. So in the Springfield area talked about how they were seeing uh, a rise in homeless population. And, you know, and, and honestly, that's where, that's a pain point that we hear a lot about, but we have a uh, little funding or influence around housing. And so, but, you know, Janet took it up, up on herself to engage her community and, um, you know, uh, uh, local uh, stakeholders. And, um, you know, from that, they, she, you know, she's happy to report that they're able to house homeless individuals through the winter months. 
um, um, with temporary housing. So, you know, it's not just about what we're doing at uh, like a state government uh, cabinet level, but it's about how communities are coming together. And I always say, we don't have to recreate the services um, in many cases or solve the problem. We just need to connect with communities and use our resources the best way um, that we can. So I think that like, if I was gonna leave you with a couple of um, kind of like final thoughts, um, and they may be longer than just a couple of minutes, but you know, what have we learned? Like plan, plan, plan. And so like plan for the worst and hope for the best. So, you know, we have, we continue to have contingency plans around how do we staff the vision of youth services facilities if, if, if everyone in that facility is quarantined uh, or isolated, if you will, because of COVID-19. Um, you know, what do we do? And we got close to this last week. If we have children's division team members who can't go out and see children um, in a timely manner to make sure they're safe after we receive a hotline. And we were close to having to um, implement that contingency plan in the Southeast, but thank goodness right now it's, um, it's looking better. Um, you know, what are we going to do in the next 90 days, in the next six months? We don't have any idea how long the federal uh, health emergency will, will um, be in place. And that does impact the work that we do. So thinking about, you know, thinking about what do we do if it stays in place, but how do we get back to, um, um, you know, a new operating rhythm if we don't have that um, federal uh, health emergency in place? Um, you know, I think the other thing is, is to continue to evaluate and listen to citizens and your team. So, you know, some of the things that I talked about, like we didn't um, get it, uh, we didn't um, um, get it right the first time, right? So we've heard citizens, um, I'll, I'll just tell you, like, uh, I own it. Our call center continues to be um, a pain point for us and we're trying to solve it. But we also heard from citizens saying, you know, you're asking me for information to make me eligible for benefits, but the only, I, I don't have a phone uh, to take a picture and send it to you. I, maybe they don't feel comfortable sending something over um, email. They use, they, they, they don't use the mail service. They want a Dropbox at our offices. Well, the issue was um, we were very concerned about having people send personal, drop off personal information when we didn't have that office staffed all the time. Um, and then there are just some federal requirements around a timeliness of processing. But what we figured out is we can reintroduce those drop boxes in our metro offices and our, our lar larger offices where we continue to have a staff presence. So, you know, kind of reintroducing or thinking about how we do things um, differently, listening to your team. So, um, you know, we, I continue to hear for team members and we try to meet them where we can with childcare pain points, right? So, um, you know, I, making sure that we are uh, allowing team members to work from home. We're being flexible with hours because we also know that many team members are not only having to do their professional job, but they're also having to be teacher and, and work on homework at night. So um, how to support that, how to support team members who have a lot of health concerns of, uh, for themselves or for their families, and they just don't feel comfortable uh, coming into an office. So continuing to that for that. I think the final thing that I would leave you with is, you know, I've really tried to look at COVID-19 as a learning opportunity. So, um, you know, how do we better serve citizens in new ways? How do we support our team members? I think it's too easy to reflect on it as just um, something we got through and not looking at it as an opportunity to do things different, to do things better. And, you know, and, and so I think, what have we learned from it? Well, we've learned that um, we can act and most of the time we're gonna, we're gonna make the right decision. I mean, sometimes we won't, sometimes we'll have to go back and rethink and we have to own that, right? But, but our, uh, in general, our actions, I think have been the right decisions um, at the right time. Um, we have great team members and great partners. So uh, that just have a passion to serve Missourians. So, you know, we do, and you're be, going to be familiar, like we have a quarterly pulse survey and we look at how our team members feel about social services. And, and one thing that we score like 90% on is, is, and I'll call it, you know, it's, it's the people believe in our work, like they believe in what we're doing. And I always tell our leadership that you can't, you can't grow and you can't develop passion. It's just there. 
Um, so then it's to think about like, how do we engage that passion to provide better uh, services for, um, you know, for Missourians, um, you know, and, and that we need to think about new ways to serve citizens. So right now in uh, our family support division, we're thinking about, okay, well, we might not be able to have drop boxes, but what about a kiosk? Like what about a kiosk where someone just walks up, they scan in their information, um, has to be pretty simple, right? But then they just take the information back in a receipt showing that it was received. Um, you know, workflow management, of course, like if we're going to be at home, we're going to have to have better workflow management just to make sure the work's getting done and it's getting to the right people at the right time. And then a virtual caseworker. So, you know, when you when you pop up on a screen, you know, you're talking just like I'm speaking with you right now that our citizens are able to speak with someone because we just know people, um, even though most of the time uh, our citizens know what they need to do and and but they just want to um, regurgitate that to someone and make sure that they're understanding that they know what they need to do. So a virtual caseworker is just a more intimate way to do that than a, a, a call uh, through a call center. Um, that we're stronger and smarter together. So I talked about partnerships. I talked about communicating. Um, I talked about working together. Um, and, you know, that the, I think the final thing is it's not just about COVID-19 over the last eight months that we have to continue important work um, that we started before COVID-19 to keep us sane. Because um, I don't want to be an agency. I don't want to be a team that looks back on the last eight months or the last year or whenever we uh, return to some kind of normalcy and um, you know say, well, that was the COVID-19 time. Like, you know, it doesn't count. I mean, we didn't do anything. So, you know, we continue to make big policy changes around how we manage child welfare investigations. I mean, you know, we are looking at some dramatic changes in how we look at Sentinel events in children's division. And we're rebidding our SNAP program to put in a, in a new system. Um, we're undertaking Medicaid expansion that passed um, as a, um, you know, as a constitutional amendment in August. And then finally, uh, with all of the program endeavors, you know, we've uh, made it a priority to uh, be a team that is inclusive, diverse, and um, that all team members feel like that they belong. So I think that that work is just important uh, uh, to, 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 to reflect on after COVID-19, what have we accomplished not only as related to COVID-19, but accomplishments I think that we would have done regardless of whether or not we were managing through a pandemic. Jennifer, fantastic. Thank you so much. I want to, uh, I want to just alert everybody who's on the webinar, please use the Q&A section for the, the next portion of, of the webinar, and that's to enter your questions and we'll, and we'll get to those. Um, first of all, um, yes, thank you very much. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stunned by the energy and the kind of excitement that you exhibit in terms of talking about a very otherwise, you know, kind of down, um, situation that that we've all been in for the last eight months and I think that there's so much uh, power in in the words that you spoke and the words that Anne spoke in terms of what state agencies have done uh, during this pandemic the other thing I want to talk about and I think you 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 said it so well and that is we're not going to look back on this just as a as a bad time in our history right especially in our history and government but as a transformative time that's going to make us and already has in some cases, we're not the same people or organizations that we were in March, right? I mean, we have, and, and you gave such great examples of what happened, but we have transformed the way we think about things, the way we look at things, the way we think about our partner organizations, how we think about our sister state agencies. So we'll never be the same, right? We're never gonna be the same after this. And, and so much of it from what you have told us is gonna be for the good, for the good of the citizens of our state. So can't thank you enough for guiding us through all of that as the leader of the department. So that leads me, I'm gonna start off with a question. We've got a couple, um, we have a couple in the queue here, but I've been thinking a lot about, in reference to what you said, you know, there are so many lessons to be learned from not only DSS, but DOC and DHSS in terms of what has happened during the time. Is the, and I know each agency is kind of handling it on their own that way. But is there kind of a, a bridge over all of those that are thinking about kind of the best practices that have come out of this, 
kind of the, the things that we need to hold on to as we move into the into the new year. Is there some effort around that, Jennifer? Yes, so we've um, spent some time um, both because um, um, I, I serve as the acting director, but I'm also, I don't have a deputy. So I sit on cabinet meetings for as an acting director, but I also sit on the deputy director's team. And we've spent a lot of time reflecting on, um, you know, like lessons learned. And so I think those themes that, you know, it, it's around communication, uh, um, you know, it's around the fact that um, we, you know, and, and you'll hear our, the state's chief, chief operating officer, Drew Erdman, they do learn do. So you have to do, and then you need to learn from that and you need to um, adjust and move forward. And so I think it was, um, you know, us being in a position where we're doing something instead of fretting about it and thinking about everything that uh, could go wrong. But yes, there has, there actually have been some papers put together from different departments around kind of what are the takeaways, what are we, uh, what are we happy to share as far as accomplishments, but also pain points. So. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Kara Page has asked a question out there, and I'm encouraging everybody for to to enter your uh, questions for uh, Director Tuval in the Q and A uh, section of the uh, toolbar, please. But Kara Page asked the question: So, how were you able to provide laptops and internet service? To all your employees so quickly. What was the? How were you able to do that? So, um, so first of all, we. I mean, it's a hodgepodge, right? So um, we have. It was a little bit easier in children's division because they had. Um, they have um, um, uh, tablets, so they do a lot of their work on tablets. So they already had devices. Not ideal, right? But it's 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 an option. We have um, a lot of team members who are using their own equipment, um, you know, their own uh, personal equipment, and um, they are um, then kind of remoting in, if you will, through, uh, you know, secure. We don't have any printing at home, um, and a, a number of our team members actually have to sign a security agreement because we deal with IRS data. And so there are some pretty um, substantial safeguards around um, IRS data, but we, it was interesting because, you know, the IRS actually clarified their guidance that allowed us to send individuals home because early, because before the pandemic, the IRS wouldn't have even allowed us to send individuals home with any kind of access to the IRS data regardless. So frankly, it, it was a hodgepodge. We did send some team members home with computers that we just had. So you know, we have some people that have a desktop, but they do traveling and have a laptop. And we just said like, you have to have, you know, like we need the laptop, right? So, um, but we're not, I mean, ideally, I would like to um, be able to have state issued equipment in every home and not ask individuals to um, use their own equipment. There are places in the state that still have um, bandwidth pain points because we're dealing in some really large systems. And unfortunately, they just aren't able to work from home even after we try, you know, maybe some of the devices that might, um, you know, amplify what bandwidth might look like. So um, it's, it, again, it's just been kind of a hod hodgepodge. Um, this is kind of funny early on. Um, we were told that we couldn't, like our team members couldn't take their monitors home, couldn't take their keyboards home, couldn't take their mouse home and I, I I got to the right person in OA and um, and um, you know our IT director he's been very supportive but you know it's just a new way for everyone to think about because even our IT department you know you they're taking a little of the risk right to for us to send that equipment home but you have to balance that with the fact that we want to keep team, team members safe and we want to be able for them to be productive when they're home. So let me check. Are there any other questions for, for Jennifer as we begin thinking about closing out today's very informative session? Okay. So Kara Page, thanks you, Jennifer, for the answer. Appreciate it very much. You're welcome. All right. Well, let's move on to the uh, kind of the closeout of this. Um, again, thank you, Jennifer, for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I'm sure that everybody else feels the energy that I felt, and uh, um, and uh, we we hope that um, we can do more, as you have said, to help support the through our partnerships, help support the department in, in their efforts. Um, 
I need to turn this now over to uh, Tiffany and Eric for a moment with the great uh, spin of the wheel. I don't know if you know, Jennifer, but we give away a, 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 a prize at the end of each of these. And so today's prize is a $50 Walmart gift card that Arches had provided. Um, and want you to know that once the wheel has spun and we do have a winner when it is uh, noted, we will certainly reach out to that person uh, to make sure that they receive the, the, receive the gift card. So here we go. Don Stanley. Don Stanley. Is Don, can you make yourself known, Don? Number second try. Katie Andrews. Katie Andrews, can you make yourself known, Katie, if you're attending? Here we go. The folks at Arches actually are checking the roster to make sure that uh, we, we don't miss one of these people. <laughs> Neanne Wedgworth. Neanne Wedgworth. Oh. Here we go. Yeah, it took us four tries the last time, I think. <laughs> Donna Wigfall. Who's Donna on? Ah, yes. Donna, is that right, Arches? Donna's the winner. Congratulations, Donna. $50 gift card from Arches. We'll get that to you. Um, So this really concludes uh, our, our webinar this afternoon. Um, you will note that once you get off, there'll be a brief survey. We would encourage you uh, to answer the questions, to, re to provide feedback for the session. We use all of those uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the conference to ensure that um, we're on the right track and doing the right thing and getting to the points and the interests of those who have attended. Um, also, Tomorrow, right, uh, a new film will be released. So keep your eyes out for the film festival release and then make sure uh, you go to sign up for our next session, which is Thursday at two o'clock. And that'll be a, uh, a panel discussion, I believe from uh, the folks at DOC, the probation and parole folks who will talk about, um, talk about the impact in terms of, of, of their work. So everybody that concludes our session for today Again, we thank you, Jennifer, for, for leading us in a great keynote. You've energized us all, I think, and uh, it's a great way to begin the week and, and this uh, third week of the conference. So thank you all. And that concludes our webinar uh, for the MRP conference today. Thank you.